Dog Kisses, page 29. Licks her pump's way of making contact, her hand outstretched for me. She greets me home with licks at my face as I bend to pet her. I get waking licks on my hand as I nap in a chair. She licks my legs thoroughly clean of salt after a run, sitting beside me. She pins my hand with her front leg and pushes open my fist to lick the soft, warm flesh of my palm. I adore her licks. I frequently hear dog owners verify their dog's love of them through the kisses delivered upon them when they return home. These kisses are licks, slobbery licks to the face, focused, exhaustive licking of the hand, solemn tongue polishing of a limb. I confess that I treat Pump's licks as a sign of affection. Affection and love are not just the recent constructs of a society that treats pets as little people. To be shod in shoes in bad weather, dressed up for Halloween, and indulged with spa days. Before there was any such thing as a doggy daycare, Charles Darwin, who I feel confident, never dressed up his pup as a witch or a goblin, wrote of receiving lit kisses from his dog. He was certain of their meaning. Dogs have, he wrote, a striking way of exhibiting their affection, namely by licking the hands or face of their masters. Was Darwin right? The kisses feel affectionate to me, but are they gestures of affection to the dog? First, the bad news. Researchers of wild canids, wolves, coyotes, <clears throat> excuse me, foxes, and other wild dogs report that puppies lick the face and muzzles of their mother when she returns from a hunt to her den. <clears throat> in order to get her to regurgitate for them. Licking around the mouth seems to be the cue that stimulates her to vomit up some nicely, partially digested meat. How disappointed Pump must be that not a single time have I regurgitated half-eaten rabbit flesh for her. Furthermore, our mouths taste great to dogs. Like wolves and humans, dogs have taste receptors for salty, sweet, bitter, sour, and even umami. The earthy, mushroomy, seaweed flavor captured in the flavor-heightening monosodium glutamate. Their perception of sweetness is processed slightly differently than ours, and that salt enhances the experience of sweet tastes. The sweet receptors are particularly abundant in dogs, Although some sweeteners, like sucrose and fructose, activate the receptors more than others, such as glucose. This could be adaptive in an omnivore like the dog, for whom it pays to distinguish between ripe and non-ripe plants and fruits. Interestingly, even pure salt doesn't kickstart the so-called salt receptors on the tongue and the roof of the mouth in dogs the way it does in humans. There's some disagreement whether dogs have salt-specific receptors at all, but it didn't take long reflecting on her behavior for me to realize that pumps licks to my face often correlated with my face having just overseen the ingestion of a good amount of food. Now the good news. As a result of this functional use of mouth licking uh, kisses to you and me, the behavior has become ritualized greeting. In other words, it no longer serves only the function of asking for food. Now it is used to say hello. Dogs and wolves muzzle lick simply to welcome another dog back home and to get an olfactory report of where the homecomer has been or what he has done. Mothers not only clean their pups by licking, they often give a few darting licks when reuniting after even a brief time apart. A younger or timid dog may lick the muzzle or muzzle vicinity of a bigger, threatening dog to appease him. Familiar dogs may exchange licks when meeting at their ends of their respective leashes on the street. It may serve as a way to confirm through smell that this dog storming toward them is who they think he is. Since these greeting licks are often accompanied by wagging tails, 
mouths open playfully in general excitement. It is not a stretch to say that the licks are a way to express happiness that you have returned. Dogologist. Page 31. I still talk about pumps looking knowingly or feeling content or capricious. These are words that cap capture something to me, but I have no illusion that they map to her experience. And I still adore her licks. But I also adore knowing what they mean to her rather than just what they mean to me. By imagining the umwelt of dogs, we'll be able to deconstruct other anthropomorphisms of our dog's guilt at chewing a shoe. If a pup's revenge wrought on your new Hermes scarf and reconstructed them with the dog's understanding in mind. Trying to understand a dog's perspective is like being an anthropologist in a foreign land, one peopled entirely by dogs. A perfect translation of every wag and wolf may elude us, but simply looking closely will reveal a surprising amount. So let's look closely at what the natives do. In the following chapters, we will consider the many dimensions contributing to a dog's umwelt. The first dimension is historical, how dogs came from wolves and how they are and are not wolf-like. The choices we've made in breeding dogs led to some intentional designs and some unintended consequences. The next dimension comes from anatomy, the dog's sensory capacity. We need to appreciate what the dog smells, sees, and hears if there are other means by which to sense the world. We must imagine the view from two feet off of the ground and from behind us, a snout. Finally, the body of the dog leads us to the brain of the dog. We'll look at the dog's cognitive abilities, the knowledge of which can help us to translate their behavior. Together, these dimensions combine to provide answers to the questions of what dogs think, know, and understand. Ultimately, they will serve as scientific building blocks for an informed, imaginative leap inside of a dog, halfway to being honorary dogs ourselves. Thank you for listening.